It's a myth that the CEO has the answers or the founder has the answers. I think often we have the passion that, you know, we're on a learning journey just the same as anyone else. Hi there. I'm Mr. Sebastian. Welcome to The Turndown. Today, I'm excited to talk to Julie from Weaver. She's the CEO and founder of a fantastic product that works and operates in the sustainability space and providing great insights to hoteliers about their performance around sustainability. Something that is critically needed. Uh, we need to make, as an industry, travel more sustainable. Our world is impacted by global warming, by over-tourism, by a lot of different things. And Julie has uh, some great insights, some great experiences uh, around making you know, travel more sustainable, uh, providing hoteliers insights uh, into their own performance, but also, you know, what they can do about changing some of their behavior and, and making their products and services more sustainable. Really, any type of property can benefit from the solutions, products, and best practices around sustainability. Let's roll the tape. I'm joined by Julie Chatham. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing this correctly. Is that correct, Julie? It's Cheatham. Close enough. Cheatham. Okay. Well, let's use that. Use that. Julie Cheatham. Uh, Julie is the co-founder of Weaver. And I'd like to open up this podcast today with uh, our standard question. What is keeping you up at night, Julie, as the founder of Weaver? So there are a few things. The one is that um, Weaver is a tech startup. And I've never been the CEO of a tech startup before. So that's been an interesting journey and working in, in the virtual space is keeping me up at night for sure. There's so much to learn. And uh -huh. then more broadly, the fact that we're not decarbonizing as quickly as we need to, to prevent that one and a half degrees of warming that the IPCC has been warning us about for years, that keeps me uh -huh. up at night. It's really worried about uh, crossing those boundaries that, you know, the point of no return. So making that required change for us to, to stay alive on this planet? Absolutely. And yeah. how, how one person can make a difference, one organization can make a difference. That often uh, gets me at about three o'clock in the morning. Wow. Wow. Well, let's talk about, you know, uh, what Weaver does in order to help hoteliers around the world uh, to become more sustainable and to make travel more sustainable. Can you walk us through a very high level of uh, what your company does and what services it provides? Sure. So Weaver was born during COVID um, when um, we are fellow hoteliers and saw the sort of challenges that were facing our industry. And so we've developed Weaver to be a digital sustainability solution. So it's accessible because it's online. It's affordable because it doesn't involve flying expensive consultants around the world. And every business has positive and negative impacts. Weaver helps you to identify all your impacts, to measure them, and then to report on them. And there's some fun things built in, all sorts of tools and resources for continuous improvement to help you. But essentially, it's an impact monitoring and sustainability management system. Yeah. What inspired you to, to come up with the product or the company? Like, uh, there must have been uh, there must have been a point in your career where you realized, I want to be a founder, I want to be a CEO, I want to create something like Weaver to make an impact. What inspired you? So I have a background in, in management consulting and also uh -huh. in running organizations, but never a tech uh -huh. startup before. And um, I was consulting, particularly in the sustainability space when COVID hit, and a number of my clients were hotels and lodges. And one of my clients, Swali Kalahari, at the time we were sitting in the middle of the Kalahari and lockdown happened and we realized the income would be turned off for the foreseeable future. And we're fortunate sure. enough to have uh, owners that can afford to keep everything going during times of, of crisis. But we saw our friends, lodges closing down, tour operators shutting down at lack of IP, conservation efforts 
needing to be stopped, people losing their jobs. And so we got a working group of like-minded people together. You know, Dr. Mm -hmm. King from the long run, Hando Hain and Sal Blanco from Preferred by Nature. We had Julia Kinsman, the sustainability journalist. <clears throat> About 20 of us got together and just said, what can we do to help? And uh -huh. after many hours of kind of workshopping, we figured the best thing to help would to put something that's really accessible out there that can help people to make their businesses more resilient. You know, financially sustainable is is of utmost importance, not just, uh, you know, nature sustainable and people sustainable. So we needed to look holistically at a business and give people the tools to do that, especially independence, uh, where we're not really embracing technology as independent hoteliers. And it really can make our lives a whole lot easier. I like where you're going with this because sustainability is so much more than just, you know, the energy light bulb or the water or the towel that you're not replacing. Walk us through, you know, when you think of sustainability, walk us through what you include and what you potentially exclude. But what are the areas that, in your opinion, sustainability includes? I think most people, Sebastian, think of sustainability as <clears throat> energy, waste, and water, and then perhaps mm -hmm. some nature and biodiversity. The way Weaver looks at it and the way I look at it is from a typical balanced scorecard perspective. If you uh -huh. have a, a balanced scorecard of four quadrants, you have to balance the commercial against the conservation, the community, and the culture, because people is more than just um, the human resources and community aspect. There's a big cultural aspect, especially in the travel industry. And so whilst energy, waste, and water are super important, things like the impact you're having on your neighborhoods and the well-being of your own staff members your company culture, how are you helping to preserve local cultures and the culture within your own organization? And commercially, are you looking at your supply chain? You know, what are those analytics telling you in terms of how local and sustainable your supply chains are? Are you looking at your own commercial performance, keeping on top of, you know, your cash flow management and your rev power and your occupancies and what your customers are telling you and their satisfaction scores? So to be truly sustainable, We've got to look at all the parts of our business together and make sure that we're equally invested in all of them and not neglecting any of them to have a balanced business uh, that's you know not extractive and exploitative and is commercially successful because without that commercial success, well, there isn't business sustainability. And that makes a lot of sense. So Weaver is providing that scorecard, that interactive, you know, consultative tool to provide you not only transparency, but also actionable insights on what to change? Yes. Yeah, so we've helped you to identify all the different areas of your business that you could work on. You don't need to work on everything at once. That can be quite uh -huh. scary. We know people find sustainability quite complex and complicated. So you can pick the things that you want to start working on first, and then we help you to measure your current performance and then set targets to improve and we suggest continuous improvement pathways to help you to get there with tools and resources for your team members uh, to, to get you going and on your way. And then great reporting functionality because as a sustainability practitioner myself, that was always uh -huh. a really difficult part is trying to cobble together different pieces of information from different sources to try and really understand your impact at the end of the financial year. No, that's so interesting. Let's say I'm a hotelier that has done and followed all the recommendations. Do I become certified? Is it a stamp? What's the, you know, what's my end of the year, I guess, certificate, if any, that I that I get as a hotelier? Weaver's not a certification. You could think mm -hmm. of us like an accounting system or a CRM. Mm -hmm. We're an mm -hmm. operating system. But what it will do is that if you choose to certify with any of the great certifications that are already out there, like Long Run, Preferred by Nature, Earth Check, One Planet, any of the GSTC recognized certifications. You have all the information at your fingertips and you can produce a report that makes your certification process so much easier. And if you choose not to certify because there's credibility in your data, right? Your data uh -huh. gives your stories credence. And so you can just share your stats. You can say our carbon footprint per bed night is 
75 kilowatt hours of carbon or we use 200 liters of water per guest bed night. Our staff wow. well-being index sits at 85%. Uh, these are the impacts of our community projects. And I think there's power in telling those stories with data behind them. If you choose to certify, it does make it a lot easier, but you don't need to certify. Okay, that's so interesting. So we started with the question, what is keeping you up at night? Let's do the reverse. What's what is helping you sleep at night or what is making you happy? What gives you a sense of satisfaction, if you will? I think following the news of all the great things happening. So, you know, I saw um, just today there's some new mushrooms or fungi that can decompose plastic in record mm -hmm. time. And there are these amazing single-use clay um, coffee cups that have been printed with 3D printers that are available at the same price as paper coffee cups. And you see turtles and whale populations that are being restored. And you see cultures and languages that people thought perhaps were gone. And now Perhaps. they've been revived and documented. And this is what tourism does. You know, we're such a great redistributor of income in our industry. And that income is a primary source for conservation, not only of biodiversity, but also cultural conservation, socioeconomic stability and growth, uh, development. And so tourism is so powerful. And that's what makes me excited is to see these examples of where these businesses are run as, a, as an inclusive, shared kind of source for good. And they're not extractive and exploitative. Um, you know, that's, I think that's what we're trying, we're all working to avoid. But there's so many great stories coming out that it's easy to be a believer. Uh -huh. That's exciting. That's, that's really, really nice to hear. And you, you're absolutely right. Like we, I heard about the mushrooms. I, I, I am excited about ocean cleanup and so many great examples of things actually making an impact and, and changing for the better. Uh, so, um, you know, awareness is certainly one, and uh, there's some great stories out there. And 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 I'm keeping fingers crossed there will be more um, of those initiatives happening around the world. I want to talk a little bit around, you know, your life as a founder and CEO. You said this was something <laughs> new, you know, to you. Uh, let's let's start maybe, you know, uh, with a common myth. You know, your your co-founder, your CEO. What's a common myth about being a CEO that you sort of realized, oh my God, maybe that's an own myth that I busted myself. Uh, but uh, I want to talk about you know your role and your learnings as CEO and founder. I think the biggest myth is that the CEO has all the answers. Uh, uh -huh. You know, your team members, especially in a startup, there's so much volatility and uncertainty, and your team members are looking to you for the answers. And your investors are looking to you for the answers and your collaborators are looking to you. And it's a myth that the CEO has the answers or the founder has the answers. I think often we have the passion, but you know, we're on a learning journey just the same as anyone else. I think what, what I've learned though, is that I do have the, the responsibility and the ability to make decisions really quickly based on the evidence produced and to know when we've got enough data to make a decision so that we can move forward. And so I think that's probably where the accountability line lies. You've got to be courageous enough to be the one that's happy to make those decisions. Uh, but we certainly don't uh, know what we're, you know, what we're doing necessarily. We're, we're learning uh, and growing with the team and growing with the business. Um, that's been my experience. Now. What what is one of the challenges that you're currently facing in your role right now, and and how are you tackling it? For me, one of the challenges we have is a, a geographically dispersed team. So Weaver is a UK based business, and our founders are a South African family of ph private philanthropists, and so we have teams based in. London, Johannesburg, Cape Town, and team members in the States as well. And building team culture, cohesion, and really sort of that high-performing environment, but that's also a learning environment and an open mindset when everybody's in different places can be really challenging. So 
we've had to spend a lot of time being really intentional about uh -huh. some of our sort of routines and our operating rhythm and how we connect with one another formally and informally uh, to make sure that, you know, that we can, because we're really moving at a very fast pace. And so to keep everybody together and on track is, is a challenge. Um, but so far, you know, the team are really rising to that challenge and we're developing a, a culture of sort of accountability and performance, but also kindness and respect that I'm really proud of. Nice. That sounds very nice. How many geographies and or time zones are you covering? I assume everyone is remote yeah. in, in your organization. Is that fair? So we do have offices in London, Cape Town, and Johannesburg, and the teams okay. work hybrid. And then team members that are outside of those centers, um, for example, in the States or other parts of the UK and Africa are remote. Um, uh -huh. We do have... Um, a support and service center that works uh, UK hours generally, no. and then yeah. responds responds digitally to customer support and technical queries outside of of those UK support hours. Oh, that's fantastic! Yeah, we Cloudbits we grew up as a as a remote company way before COVID, uh, and all of our we don't really have offices. I mean, we have a headquarter in San Diego which has a small, very small office, mostly for investors, HR and uh, finance, uh, potentially. Um, we do something called Donut within our company, which is really interesting. It's sort of the coffee break, and it matches up two people that don't work together for 15 minutes, um, you know, uh, in regular intervals. And it's uh, it's something, it's an extension of of Slack, and it's really interesting because it's completely uh, automated. And, and I get to meet people that I would never usually work with, which is fantastic, hear their stories. And it's just about, you know, thinking, having a coffee break, you know, which which we are missing often in this remote yeah. disconnected world. And uh, I love that. Um, Julie, I, I want to do a that. lightning. Yeah, it's called Donut, like we call I'm it I'm stealing donut. it. I'm totally stealing Please. it. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Please. I want to do a lightning round. Uh, so I'm curious to sort of get your first immediate reaction on words that I'm going to throw at you. And, you know, there's no right or wrong answer, as you know, like these, these are just, you know, uh, your, your sort of first impressions or your first thoughts that, that come to mind. Uh, I'll start with, I'll start with departures. Departures should be from business as usual. We should always right. change the way we did things yesterday. Excellent. Luggage. Luggage, you should travel light because it's easier to use public transport. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Distraction. Distractions are a part of life. So I have to learn to just hyper focus and shut out the noise. Excellent. Direct uh, versus, uh, I guess, third party booking channels. I think there's a place for both. I think direct business has a huge benefit to the hoteliers themselves and third party booking channels are really important so that travelers feel <laughs> safe and secure and are able to go to destinations that they otherwise might not feel confident visiting. So I think there's a place for both. Excellent. Uh, travel in 2030. Well, I'm hoping it's not all going to be virtual. I'm hoping we're going to rage against the complete AI experience <laughs> and Excellent. that we will go and visit places and do it, you know, slowly and really immerse ourselves and continue traveling and yeah, sharing these life-changing experiences. Social media. Necessary evil. I don't okay. really... I don't really get it, but thank goodness my team does. So we have such wonderful people to help in Weaver. Okay, cool. Leisure. Leisure, I think, is an awesome idea if you can pull it off and uh -huh. if you can take your family and your loved ones with you. I don't like the idea really of chilling out without my people. So, yeah, leisure needs to kind of blend for me with, with family and friends too. Otherwise, it can be lonely. All right. Housekeeping? 
I think housekeeping is so important in our industry because it gives access to a sector that doesn't have a high barrier to entry from a skills and education perspective. And it also gives access to women and single mums and people that might not otherwise have employment. And so I'm devastated when I see hotels trying to minimize housekeeping, especially if they do it in the name of sustainability. You know, don't reduce your cost base um, and your payroll <laughs> and then claim it was for sustainability purposes. It's way more sustainable to keep all of your housekeepers and work with them on, on better standard operating procedures. Nice, nice. Uh, and then last but not least, but it, it's the name of our podcast, Turn Down. What comes to mind when I say Turn Down? Being spoiled. As all, okay. Like such beautiful memories of turn downs all, you know, all over the world in special hotels and lodges where something significant like a little story or a small gift or a handmade suite is left on your pillow. And it's it's usually representative of where you are and it, that sense of place. So turn down, yeah, it makes me feel warm and special before bedtime, if I think of nice. yeah, that nice. concept. I want to talk a little bit about, um, I guess, the impact of COVID in general on travel, right? Um, and 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 your personal experiences to that as well. Um, everyone has their COVID story, and you know what happened during and right after, and and how we got out of that. Uh, my, I'm curious, what did you learn from it? Like, what were some of the sort of thoughts that you took out from this? pandemic that you said, hey, this has changed me, this has evolved me, this this is something that I've learned from from this experience. What would that be? As a leader, I think COVID taught me that people are not as okay as you think that they are. I think uh -huh. COVID pushed people to the limit in terms of working from home and homeschooling and trying to hold on to jobs and trying to create new sources of income. Uh, and in our industry, you know, having to mothball lodges and try to keep people going. But what came out of that for me is that I, people probably weren't 100% okay before COVID, but we are just wow. kind of on this treadmill. And so COVID kind of pushed us to have conversations about what is it that you need from from your employer? What is it that you need from your employees? What is it that you need from your friends and families and partners and no, and and I think those conversations are important. Um, I still don't think I have a perfect solution, you know, for for how to help people be okay after COVID. But that's probably the thing that stuck with me the most is um, is how do what is the new normal going to be for for running a team, for leading an organization, uh, and for hospitality. Hmm. And I don't think we have yet all the answers to that. No. It sounds like it. But at least we have an observation or we have a feeling that we need to change certain things. And reversely, do we have to spend more time managing people or interacting I, with people? I think so. I think I've had to spend more time engaging with team members because it's less of the transactional engagements. We do that too. Yeah. You know, we're delivering a uh -huh. business at a very fast, high-performing pace. But there's got to be time for those uh, deeper engagements to just to listen and make sure I know what's going on across the team and, you know, who needs what before, uh -huh. before somebody burns out or before somebody leaves for a better job or a different opportunity. You know, I, I want to make sure that Weaver is their best opportunity. Well, that's very interesting. What changes to travel didn't you see coming that came out of the pandemic? Was there anything that you saw, you know, a trend in travel that was to you at least unexpected? I think the sort of vehemence with which some countries were just avoided and shut down and it uh -huh. seemed it seemed really arbitrary, you know, like uh -huh. the UK would have their red list and the USA would have their list of places that were on the danger list and all, all these kind of things. And it seemed a bit arbitrary when you looked at the number of infections and the death rates and things like that. So for me, that was a real surprise. And I think it spoke to the the 
it reinforced the importance of diversity and inclusion and changing mindsets. Because I think immediately unconscious biases just sprang up, you know, and Mm -hmm. people made assumptions about countries or their infrastructure or how safe people would be there or whatever the case was. And that just, for me, reminded me how important the diversity and inclusion and allyship kind of work is um, because clearly we're not there yet. Yeah, it certainly felt like walls were being built uh, with, with through government controls or regulations, and um, and which is unfortunate, right? Um, because it takes usually a long time destroying these walls, right? You build them up very quickly. And then I was reading a statistic recently uh, for the World Travel Organization that was publishing 145 countries have no COVID restrictions. But reversely, there are still quite a few that do, uh, where you're not able to travel easily, where you're not able to move quickly in and out, uh, which which seems, uh, seems staggering at times. And for a sector that employs, you know, 10% of the world's population, <laughs> that's, exactly. that's a lot of, that's a lot of people who are impacted when people, you know, can't enjoy hospitality. Yeah. You're in the tech space right now. I'm curious about what technology you think will disrupt travel, the travel industry, you know, the most in the upcoming years. I think that the most positive disruption is going to be flight technologies, the aviation. So looking okay. at new new energies, so perhaps hydrogen fuels, certainly sustainable aviation fuel is already, you know, on its way. But looking at uh-huh. new cra- aircraft technologies and new sort of... Um, energy technologies and sources for aviation will enable tourism to really continue to grow and thrive and continue to do the good work that it does. But I think that we really need to get that right. Yeah, very interesting. I can't wait to fly on an electric plane. It seems far-fetched, but uh, I don't know whether it's, uh, to your point, uh, a change in fuel or whether we we change completely how we propel each other. Uh, into the air, which which would be scary, but uh, I'm looking forward to that day. That's a that's a great point. Um, we we of course are building a place for a future generation in in our preparation. You have you have children. I have children. I'm very curious about you know uh, what piece of advice you would have for someone starting in this industry, whether it's in technology or uh, travel. It doesn't really matter, but. What do you recommend our future generation of of leaders and executives around the world? I think two things. The one is um, really, really go and understand a place and be part Mm -hmm. of a place before you want to go and uh, build a hotel there or work in a hotel there um, or promote a lodge there because you need to understand what's important to the people in the neighborhoods and the communities of that place and what their um, assets and worries and needs are in that area um, so that things don't become contrived. Uh, And the second thing I'd say is it's the best industry in the world. Like you're in for such an amazing ride because of the amazing people and places but try not to get sucked in by the luxury and the glitz and the glamour and the superficial stuff that is prevalent in our sector. Try to get underneath a little bit and also experience what's real. That's so nice. That's so nice. I'm curious if there's an area or a topic that you're passionate about that I haven't asked you yet. Uh, is there something that you know you feel passionate about that that we haven't touched on, let's say? Um, yeah, thanks for, for that. There's two things, actually. Uh, the one is technology. I think uh-huh. many of the big hotel corporations have embraced technology, but by and large, um, our industry is independently owned or small collections. And we're not like the automotive industry or manufacturing or textiles where we have these sort of typical systematized approaches to things and technology is kind of being thrown at us. For the most part, we have to figure it out and we uh-huh. haven't really embraced technology. So just think of like your Fitbit, you know, and Strava 
if you wanted to train yourself for a marathon 20 years ago or even your first 5k it was really hard uh -huh. Whereas now your watch can do everything for you from your stretching plan to your heart rate monitoring, your performance, your personal best, all of this. And, and, you know, we've got to do the same, I think. And I'm really passionate about how can technology and AI and machine learning and all of these great things that are available to us, how can that make our industry better and more inclusive and have better impacts? Um, and then my, my second passion really is is just is human rights. And it makes me sad when I see the colonial legacy of tourism and how places become owned almost by outsiders and actually not by people who live in and have a heritage and an ancestry and history in that place. Um, and, you know, why should regular citizens have to use less water so that massive hotels can be giving their guests tropical rainforest showers? Um, you know, to me, that's just crazy. So for me, tourism needs to share and we need to share the value that we create together and we need to be inclusive. And so that's really the part that I'm the most passionate about, I suppose, as an individual. But um, we're just passionate about all of it officially. Perfect. Yeah. And as a traveler, what do you do? Like, and I'm curious what you do personally, like when you see something like this happening, right? Uh, do you avoid the destination? Do you avoid the, the country where you see this prevalent or do you, do you choose a different destination that is maybe more advanced or maybe encouraging diversity more? I'd love to get your thoughts. Yes. So there are destinations that I avoid entirely because. Okay. I'm not comfortable with their particular political regime or, you know, their human rights abuses. Or, and I get asked perhaps to go there to speak at a conference or something. And then uh -huh. I really have to wrestle with that for the benefit of the business versus, you know, what I'd like to do. In my personal life, I always try to choose smaller, locally owned um, kind of boutique hotels or small lodges. Um, where I know that they're owned by individuals and not by big conglomerates. And uh -huh. those individuals have some sort of a history in the place. And I try to make sure that the family goes on tours and excursions that are led by people from the area and that have more local sort of knowledge and significance. So I suppose we try to make sure our dollars stay where we are having those amazing experiences. You know? And... Um, yeah, follow the money really is, is what I yeah. try and do. Yeah. That's, that's so valuable. Uh, I'm very curious as a follow-up on that, you know, what's your favorite travel destination in the world? So I think being African, my heart is here and Kenya is my favorite African destination. It's just mm -hmm. so beautiful in terms of safari and beaches. And then uh -huh. you you just can't go wrong with uh, Chile in South America with the most beautiful mountains, beaches, forests. It's just magnificent. And the cultural experiences in Chile are so amazing. And South Africa for food and culture and uh, the beautiful beaches along our coastlines, as well as the beaches of Australia. So those are probably the, the destinations that stand out most for me. But Kenya would be my happy place. So Kenya is number one, followed by Chile, and then at home or Australia first? Probably South Africa first and then Australia. Okay, excellent, excellent. Julie, thank you so much for joining us today. I uh, really appreciate the insight. Fantastic what you're doing with Weaver. Wishing you all the best uh, um, as a CEO and, uh, you know, uh, as a company. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Sebastian. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to The Turndown. Don't forget to subscribe and tune in next week as we discover new exciting guests.